Hi everyone, it's Mia. I'm back again uh, with a new series or a, a, a new aspect of our series, a new episode in our series, um, our Back to School Speaker series. We are going to hear from a couple of reading teachers from across our landscape um, that will give us some insights about like what were they experiencing as educators in the past year, what they're hopeful for in the coming year, and what has been working with them. And we hope that you get the opportunity to learn from them and learn from the experiences that they will be um, engaging in. Um, these are also people that are in your network. These are alum, and so you should feel free to reach out um, uh, whenever you feel the, the need to. Um, my name is Mia, uh, and I'm your host for the day, um, and we'll uh, get started here, um, but I'm going to have our two folks introduce our introduce themselves. So we'll start off with you, Brianna, um, if you could come off and, and tell us who you are. Uh, perfect. Uh, my name is Brianna Crabtree. I was in Greater Cleveland TFA Corps in 2015. I stayed at my placement school for six years and then last year switched over to um, becoming the Dean of Instruction at Citizens Leadership Academy Southeast. Um, I taught social studies for three years taught ELA for, no, I taught social studies for three and a half, I switched mid, midway my social, between like a social studies class into teaching ELA midway throughout the year. Um, and really just kind of learned like, okay, this is a whole new ball game of like helping students, you know, learn how to read and build those skills. Um, and then when I switched over into this side, I um, assist ELA teachers as well as science and math teachers. And so, I've also seen how reading affects every single subject and not just ELA class. Excellent. Thank you so much for that wonderful introduction, Brianna. Um, so true. There's so many things you said there that I'm hoping to pick up on um, a little bit more as we continue to talk. Um, now I'm going to kick it over to you, Sydney, um, if you could introduce yourself. Hi, everyone. My name is Sydney Taylor. I was a 2019 Greater Cleveland Corps member. Um, I started off teaching 11th grade English at Lincoln West School of Global Studies in CMSD. I was there for a year, got necessary transferred um, after we went home for the COVID lockdown, which was pretty horrible. Um, but I did have the opportunity to join the staff at Garrett Morgan School of Leadership and Innovation. Um, so I was the founding English teacher there in 2020. I taught ninth grade English there for two years. Um, and I actually just resigned at the end of this past school year because I am going to be pursuing a Fulbright. Um, I'm going to be a adjunct professor at Prince Sultan University in Riyadh, Saudi Arabia. I leave in about a week. Um, so I will be teaching college students there, which will be a little bit of a switch up uh, from high school. And I also did my master's in education at Johns Hopkins during my first two years in the Corps. Thing. I'm realizing that I'm on mute. I apologize for that. Um, so yes, we have a remarkable group of folks um, to to chat with uh, today. Um, Sydney um, is bringing a wealth of perspective, and so is Brianna, um, of the different ways in which we are um, uh, people in our network are going to engage in the teaching of reading or the teaching of English. Um, and so we're excited to jump on in there. So we'll start off with our first question, and you all should feel free, whoever feels like they have the passion to answer this question just come off mute and, and and jump in but I'm just curious what were the the highlights and lowlights from your school year last year to help bring us into the context of your school um, and and help us see like what what was it what were the good things that happened last year and some of the things that were not so great I can start with that one. Um, I'll get the lowlights out of the way first. <laughs> uh, last year was undoubtedly my hardest year of teaching, uh, which I didn't think would be the case going into my third year. Um, I essentially had students who went home when schools closed as seventh graders, and then they came back to school as high schoolers and were expected to go to eight periods a day and transition classes and take on the workload of having six classes at a time. Um, 
that and then just social emotional learning that had been lost um, during those two years. Just a lot of, of pent up emotions, anger, all the things were very, very prevalent in my students. Um, and a, that took a lot out of away from instruction. Um, so that was definitely a challenge. But I think the highlight, we were all so, so excited for our students to come back in person. Um, even when they got there, we're like, wait a second. <laughs> um, but overall, it was just really great to see kids grow in front of me, um, to get to know my students, to you know match the faces with the names that I knew from virtual learning, um, and also see kids fall in love with literature or with the podcasts that we listen to or kind of take some aspect from the classroom and show that they really enjoyed it because uh, I did try to kind of switch things up and give them more ownership over their own learning and give them options and for a lot of students that seemed to be the first time they'd ever had those choices in their education um, so it was really cool to kind of watch them grow over the course of that year so they lost a lot of learning but I think once they came back things kind of were accelerated, um, which was really awesome to see. Um, I can do the same and start with the lowlights. They weren't much different. Um, a lot of it had to do with, of course, students just not being used to sitting in a desk for eight hours a day or not having the ability to go to the bathroom when they want or cook a meal when they want or have the TV on in the background. Um, and so it definitely was an adjustment for students and teachers. I mean, just the physical labor that in-person teaching requires of teachers. Um, that was another stress point of there were things that you can get done when you're at home that you necessarily can't when you're in the school building. And so I felt like from both sides, both teachers and, stu and students, everyone was kind of stressed and pushed to their, you know, pushed to their limit of what they could handle. Um, one thing though in that was the transition back into in-person learning. We were um, not in person for the whole year of COVID at Breakthrough Schools. So like for the whole year prior to last year, um, where some other schools kind of went in the last few months. So due to that, our students, the last time they were in a building was March 2020. Um, and so there was a lot of um, social emotional learning that they definitely didn't have, as well as a lot of um, just like having to work the entire class period. So like not having an option to opt out if they wanted to opt out. Um, and so with that, there were a lot of struggles, but also the network from like a district level had to reflect on what practices they were putting in place, um, whether it was from a behavioral lens or whether it was from a um, instructional lens. And so one thing that really we gained out of this experience and became a highlight is that students struggle with comprehension. And there was such a push for skill for like skill growth and for us to teach skills and not really teach how to read. And so now we have shifted because of the learning loss and helping students learn how to read, which is something that we probably should have been doing even before COVID, but it took something as major as COVID for it to kind of shake everyone up and um, start that process. And so with that, just seeing a like a reemergence of a love for reading and the focus being again back on the books and not just what you can do or what you can teach through the book. Um, and so that's been really nice to see. Excellent. Thank you both for sharing that. I think that's really helpful to see that there's commonalities despite the different grade bands that you all were working with and despite the different um, school structures that you were teaching in as well. Um, and I'm sure that heading into this year, there are some things that you all have learned from last year, some things that you're very excited about this coming year. I'm really interested to see what are the opportunities that you see in the coming year? What outcomes are you, know, are you trying to strive for? Um, some of you have already started school, so then you know that you're about to start your next opportunity. But I'm curious to hear what you all think the opportunities are um, in the coming year. My teaching situation will obviously look a little bit different, um, but just from perspective of K-12 education, I think hopefully COVID will no longer be a disruption in our students' education, ideally. Um, so knowing that is kind of behind us, I think gives us opportunity to look forward, but also reflect on some of the things that went wrong, some of the things that we were doing wrong before COVID, like Brianna said. Um, 
and also capitalizing on the technology that we were given during COVID. Um, my first year of teaching, I was teaching 11th grade. My students were expected to go off to college, but they had never used laptops in a classroom. Or the laptops that we did have barely worked. They had very little technology skills. Um, and I think people assume, oh, well, you know, Gen Z knows how to play on their phone, so they know how to use a laptop, which could not be further from the truth. Um, so I think capitalizing on a lot of the digital and technological resources that we had the opportunity to get for the first time as a result of COVID is going to be really great um, to figure out, okay, how do we utilize these in the classroom, um, but also still maintaining hands-on learning and some of the traditional teaching methods that I think are tried and true. Um, so I think that will be a big opportunity in the coming year. Um, one major opportunity that I'm really excited for is our district as a whole has made literacy our number one priority this year. Um, and so normally there are about five or six priorities that come out in the summer. And so this year they are like truly honing in on literacy because no other priority um, can be successful if students don't know how to read and if they don't have a true love of reading. So the thing that I'm most excited about is just having students in every single class be able to build their literacy skills, whether it's through a word problem or whether it's through a novel. Um, and seeing how that gives them the confidence to then advocate for themselves. Because a lot of times, you know, like our mission and even in TFA, right, like our mission is to help students become advocates for themselves in the world. But a lot of that is stunted because if they don't know how to read, we're actually um, holding them back from being the true leaders in their society that they can be. Um, so it, it it lends to me that like, in order for advocacy to occur, students need to know how to read and they need to know how to advocate for themselves. Excellent, thank you. Um, you both of you um, uh, have so much passion and so much um, uh, uh, optimism about what could possibly happen. And um, it's unique to hear the, the, the answers that you all are um, giving to this. It's um, refreshing as well. So um, I know that you know you all probably have hopes, you know, for um, what you all will achieve either with your students or new initiatives that your school building is going to or your, your district is going to um, uh, roll out. I'm curious, like, what are you all hoping to achieve? Um, like, how will you know at the end of the year, I feel really successful or I will feel I felt successful if, if this happens? What is that for you? I think for me personally, it is just to create lifelong readers, um, readers that have passion for reading, that have the joy in reading. Um, and particularly that comes out of me and my why of why I do this. Um, I was in middle school and high school and I was in advanced classes, but because it was always like skill and drill with reading, it made, it like kind of sucked the joy out of reading for me to where even as an adult, I have, I struggle with finding joy in reading because it seems like a chore because I was just kind of brainwashed to reading being something I had to do in order to be successful in school and not something that I could find pleasure out of. So I hope at the end of this year, so we're starting um, a DEER program at our school where students will have time to just read a book for pleasure, not a, not a book that they're reading in ELA. And I hope that that helps them build that like true love of reading where they can see reading as an escape and um, not just as something that they need to do to have good grades. Yeah, I agree with Brianna. I think I was a similar English student and that I was not about to pick up Old Man in the Sea when I was 15 years old. Like, I feel like so much of what we were assigned was classical literature, like Frankenstein. So my goal, I, I did not like English as a kid. So one of the things that drove me to be an English teacher was, well, English has can be so fun. Like you can go so many different directions. I was not kind of confined to my curriculum in the way that a lot of my other co like other teachers in my school were because of the contents that they taught. Um, so I think having kids gain a love for reading is so, so important from a young age and giving them choice. Um, we read Born a Crime by Trevor Noah and kids like really ate that up because it's like reading comedy, right? Or like I said, podcasts. So I think one, students loving literature. And then I obviously will be working with a large English language learning population, which I have in the K-12 um, setting as well, but also just 
seeing confidence grow in my students. I myself have been a language learner and I know how hard it can be to put yourself out there and, you know, risk sounding dumb to learn a new language. So I kind of get that. Um, so I think just building confidence in my students will be huge. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm hoping to achieve this year. Yes, excellent. Um, that sounds really fascinating. And even as I reflect, um, I have, uh, for those of you out in the internet sphere, um, I have a three-year-old and I'm and trying to instill in her the love of reading. And it's so remarkable how you all have made the connection between um, the, there's a difference between the reading that we do when we're younger and the, the reading that we um, and press upon students to do when they're older. Um, and we take a little bit of the joy out of it by, you know, picking things that perhaps aren't people aren't, aren't you know, people's first choice. Um, not to say that there's some of those classics, you know, aren't, aren't great. Um, you live, reflect on them when you're, you know, uh, much older and you have, have some uh, joy in thinking about them. But um, as a kiddo, yeah, I'm sure it's probably a little tough. Um, so I'm, I'm curious to hear uh, from you all about what are some like some things that you are doing to stretch yourself um, to um, like the resources that you are using in order to um, develop yourselves as a professional as you go throughout the year? And do you have any recommendations um, to folks um, as they as they teach reading this year or, or think about trying to adopt some of the things that you all have shared um, so far? Yeah, something that we've been working with, we actually just had um, for our network, a man named Kareem Weaver. Um, and he is out of Oakland and he talks about the importance of literacy. And so I've been reading a lot of his his stuff that he has online. He has a lot of articles. He has a Twitter feed. Um, he also has a website about it as well. Um, and then there is a science of reading podcast that I've been listening to, um, which talks a lot about just how you would break um, break apart like a mathematical equation. There actually is a science of learning how to read. And so a lot of the biggest like game changer for me is that it's really hard to be a proficient reader if you don't understand phonics. Um, but a lot of times in middle school and high school, we skip over that and just say like, okay, well, if we give them enough hard text, it's going to be fine. And eventually they'll catch on, but we're actually doing a disservice because we're just, we're like giving them struggle without the tools to push through it and persevere through it. So that's been kind of changing for me of just like looking at listening to that podcast and gaining those resources. Yes, absolutely. Um, I really appreciate you sharing that. And um, I am going to ask you um, an additional question because while we're waiting for Sydney, she's and he's having yeah. a little bit of a tech issue. Um, she'll be right back. I'm curious, you know, Brand, you work in a school where there are a lot of other core members um, mm -hmm. in your building who are new um, and just starting out. Um, do you have any specific recommendations for like you know, how they develop that passion for reading and, and their kiddos, um, how they implement new things that are being rolled out in the district. Any recommendations for them? Um, I think at the end of the day, just cons like consistently finding an engaging way to like engage students in the lesson. I said engaging twice, but um, just like really getting students engaged in the lesson because if students aren't having fun, like if our students are not enjoying what they're doing, then it is going to it's going to be a, a higher hurdle that they have to cross in order to understand the material. So I think from one, we should be creating lessons that are relevant to students, that have characters in books that are relevant to students, um, making sure that even in that, that we're not making assumptions or stereotypes for our students of assuming that. So like, for example, our school is a uh, predominantly black. So making sure that we, if we're a white educator, aren't making an assumption of all Black students in Cleveland want to read about this. So like actually giving surveys of like, what are your interests? What are you into? Um, making sure that we're checking our own biases and assumptions about that and what students enjoy. Um, and then from that, just like having fun, like I've found like the easiest thing to do is like have students do like readers theater where they like change their voices for different characters or, you know, me as the teacher doing that as well. And just kind of being silly and fun because even at the middle school level, they still want to have fun and they're still kids at heart. And so the more that we can um, implement joy in all of our lessons, the more that students will be bought into it and will be willing to do the hard work of learning how to read if they know that they're going to have fun while they're doing it. 
Excellent. And Sydney, thank you so much. I'm so glad we were able to work out those tech issues. Um, I'm glad you're back. So when I ask you the same question, like what is working for the folks that are in your building? Um, what is working in the area of reading or what do you think will be working for folks when, when you um, head overseas um, and, and start teaching? And then I'm going to ask you the other question about their core member recommendations too. Okay. Um, I'm bummed I didn't get to hear the first part of Brianna's answer, um, but I can talk a little bit about. So when we um, went virtual, I only saw my students for two hours a day or two hours a week, sorry, um, which was insane when you think about it, going from five hours of instruction to two. Um, so reading novels was not in the cards for us in that environment. Um, so I had to kind of think about, OK, how can we still have students read, focus on literacy while not trying to get through a 20 chapter novel while we're virtual. Um, so we listen to the serial podcast. Um, and also our school's mission is very much rooted in civic engagement and social justice and public policy. So season three of Serial is actually all about the Cleveland criminal justice system. Um, so students listen to that. Most of them had never listened to a podcast. Um, so it was pretty cool for them to kind of get used to that medium of learning. Um, and then they also had transcripts for the podcast. So it was really awesome for students to be able to listen and then also read at the same time. So for my um, students with IEPs or for my English language learners, that provided an accommodation for them that didn't take away from the learning of other students as well. I would also have other students that are like, I would rather just read this or I would rather listen to it while I'm cleaning my room. Um, so giving them options to engage in literature in kind of non-conventional ways was really cool. Um, and then we actually had a virtual guest speaker series during that time where we brought people that were in the podcast to talk to our students. So Mayor Frank Jackson came and talked to our students. Um, a lot of the judges that were in the podcast came and did a Q&A with our students. Um, so just exposing them to kind of bringing things to life for them, I think was really awesome. Um, so trying to, to center that, so making things kind of proximate to our students. A lot of them were like, oh my gosh, I know this place or I know this person that's mentioned in the podcast. Um, so that was really cool and kind of pushed me as a teacher to do something different. Um, and then when we came back in person, I, what did we do? We did Born a Crime, like I said, um, and I got some flack for this from some veteran teachers and my principal, but I like audiobooks. Um, and I think research shows that's kind of, it's an archaic thing for teachers to be like, oh, audiobooks don't work. Like kids don't need to listen. They do. Because for kids to hear a fluent reader read to them and they can follow along in the text that is so powerful and so good for learning. Um, and with Born a Crime specifically, they heard Trevor Noah read it to them. So it was the author's voice and you kind of can't duplicate that. And I also taught five times a day, so I didn't want to read the same thing five times a day. So obviously we would pa pause and stop and talk about things. Um, but that was a game changer for me. And when my principal gave me an attitude about it, I sent him some research articles like, you're wrong. This is actually rooted in research. Um, and then as a school building, I think Brianna kind of talked about literacy being the main priority cross-curricular. And I think that kind of norming on what literature and writing looks like across content is really, really important. So something that we did, and we were a new school, so the two years I taught there was the first two years it was in existence. So something that was important for us was saying, OK, well, if students are expected to write in a classroom, they need a streamlined graphic organizer. So kind of norming on what do we expect students to write? What does that look like? What are our expectations for them across content areas and across grade levels? I think really got students used to the format of writing and providing scaffolds and graphic organizers again elevated my students with IEPs or my students that were learning English as a second language, but it also didn't like uh, hamper the learning of my students who were already there. Um, so I think for me, it was finding accommodations and modifications that were good for everyone. And if they didn't need them, they could put them to the side and continue learning. Um, so those were some things that were working for us. Excellent. That sound really uh, uh, marvelous. Um, and um, I am team audiobooks um, as well. I, I, I 
personally read a lot um, and have found that the uh, there are books that I have reread in an audiobook and have found new meaning just because of the way that I listen to it. And so I thank you for saying that. Um, and also note that that's, I, as a person who is a former uh, special education teacher, that it, that is an accommodation in a very um, helpful way, you know, to provide multiple different modalities um, for people to be able to um, engage in um, uh, great works of, of, of literature. It also so, too is a common course standard to like look at the multiple oh. formats. So it's also in that part is helpful too. So if anyone's pushing back, like there's a lot of evidence to back you up, like Sydney said. Excellent. Thank you for that, Brianna. That's always good. Bring us back to reality, to the to the to the core, the curriculum. Um, uh, so, uh, Sydney, I wanted to ask you um, an additional question, the same question that I asked um, Brianna. But I'm I'm curious to hear, like, there's core members who are starting new things. You're starting something new. So you're going to teach in a classroom that's in a completely different place. And some of our core members are coming to teach um, in places that are unique to them, um, not places that they have previously been in before. Um, what recommendations do you have um, uh, for them as they set upon um, this new year? Yeah, I think I was new to Cleveland. Um, I did go to Ohio State for undergrad, so I was familiar with Ohio. Um, I think it was nice teaching high schoolers. My students were like, 17, 18, and I was 22 year old high school English teacher. So I like asked my students, you know, where should I go in the community? What are some things that I can do? And just kind of build commonalities between my students on that. Um, as far as instructional, I CMSD is a little different than breakthrough in that there weren't a lot of curriculum materials handed to me saying like this is what you're expected to teach which was good and bad um so as a first year teacher it's like wait a second <laughs> who said i was allowed to do this um so i leaned on veteran teachers which i was fortunately always in a position where veteran teachers were happy to help me um and i hope that everyone is in that same situation as well i also did a ton of research so i joined facebook groups for example i taught the great gatsby there is an entire Facebook group dedicated to teaching the Great Gatsby. Um, there are so many resources and materials on the internet. Not all of them are spectacular, but you can kind of comb through them and figure out, you know, take bits and pieces from places and figure out, okay, what what is my goal? What do I want to do here? And I also think my um, graduate program at Hopkins helped me a lot in doing self-reflection as I was teaching. Um, one of the biggest things it taught me was backwards planning. I think as a early teacher, it can be like, okay, well, this is what we're going to do today, or this is what we're going to do this week. But you need to be thinking, okay, at the end of this quarter, what do I want my students to be able to produce? Or what do I hope that they have learned? Or at the end of this semester, at the end of this school year. So being intentional about those things and really kind of stopping it, it's hard. It's hard to do, especially as a first year teacher, um, to think that far ahead, because you're just kind of trying to survive. Um, but definitely utilize the internet for resources, utilize your fellow core members, utilize TFA alumni, utilize the PD fund. Um, I think I did that once or twice as well. There's so much out there in this time that you can definitely find what you need. Thank you for that lovely plug of the PD fund. I appreciate that. That was fantastic. I mean, we did not set her up to do that either. <laughs> um, so speaking of the PD fund, um, I'm curious, do you all have any um, resources, books, or PDs that you do recommend? Um, it's our closing question, and hopefully folks will take that um, and, and use the PD fund um, and message Heather to figure out how they can utilize it. Yeah, I kind of I kind of mentioned it earlier, but just like um, we definitely follow Kareem Weaver on Twitter. Um, it's K-A-R-E-E-M. Weaver, W-E-A-V-E-R. Um, and then there's also the Science of Reading podcast that's really good. Um, some resources that I also have used, um, there's a book called Reading Reconsidered. Um, and it's like from a Teach Like a Champion, um, from the Teach Like a Champion author who definitely has some like, you know, some ways to improve. So definitely like read it, you know, with a fine-tuned comb, but mm -hmm. definitely has some like nuggets that you can get some really good information out to help you teach reading in all classes. Excellent. Thank you for that. I um, 
like learning for justice. It used to be teaching tolerance. They rebranded, I think, about a year ago. They have really great lesson plans on their website that you can kind of break down by whether it's historical events or whether it's kind of topics or characteristics that you want to focus on. I think they have a lot of SEL stuff as well, um, which is so easily touched on in an English classroom. Um, you can really like pull from those things and make it academic and make it standards based, which I always enjoyed. Um, facing history is great. I think they're Cleveland based. I'm pretty sure um, some of our CMSD schools have facing history models. So they have a ton of lesson plans. Um, when I taught to kill a mockingbird my first year, which I will never teach that again, um, but teaching tolerance did have really good um, curriculum, for, like literally from the first page of the book to the end of the book. They had so much resources and materials. Um, as a first year teacher, that was super, super helpful. Um, they also do free online PDs. I love Clint Smith, um, who's a fellow TFA alum. And he did a PD once there that was free that I joined in during COVID. Um, again, TFA resources and PD funds. I think my graduate program was huge for me. Um, I wouldn't do it if it doesn't make financial sense for you. Um, but I think it, it definitely elevated me as a teacher and especially during my first two years, kind of forced me to stop and pause and reflect and grow um, in ways that I don't know that I would have been able to do had I not been enrolled. Um, time management wise, it's tough. So <laughs> maybe maybe start that second year if you want to kind of ease into things. I was just a lunatic. Um, but yeah, those things were all very helpful to me. Yeah, I will say my, because I also did the Johns Hopkins program and I started my second year and I can't imagine starting my first year. So I don't know how you did that. Um, but it also was like incredibly transformational to my teaching practice um, on multiple levels. So I would highly recommend that as well. Excellent, folks. And so if you are um, thinking about a way that you could try to take advantage of those, um, uh, all of those wonderful things, things that were said, um, reach out to Heather Axton at teachforamerica.org and she can connect you to any of those um, resources, but um, she can also help you figure out um, payment for any of those things that they have costs associated with them. So um, one final plug that we want to share, um, I hope, well, I prob probably won't get to see you there, Sydney, but Brianna, I hope to get to see you um, at our Cleveland back to school picnic on September 24th. We also have one in Cincinnati on September 17th. Um, and uh, we really hope that you all um, take the opportunity to join us there. Um, there's a registration link that has been flying around in all of your inboxes. So please, please, please come out and join us and bring a friend, bring a teacher, bring your principal, bring whoever you would like um, uh, who just wants to fellowship with um, other teachers and leaders and educational um, equity advocates. Uh, thank you both, Rihanna and Sydney, for your time today. I've really appreciated getting to chat and getting to know you all better. Um, you know, we all we don't we don't script these things, and so um, I. It's always fantastic to, to get to hear so many unique um, and lovely and refreshing reflections um, from folks in our community um, and folks in our network. Thank you. And I hope you all have a wonderful day. And thanks for tuning in.